Hey Tommy, can you believe that we've put on 4,000 miles onto the new Ford Bronco? We're doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah, and in this video slash podcast, we're not going to be talking about the Bronco, but we're going to be talking about what it's like to live with not just the Bronco, but the Wrangler. How do we get a Wrangler? Well, we bought one long term. Actually, I bought one long term. We've also had them a lot. Uh, and of course, when we got the Bronco, we had to call Toyota and say, hey guys, can we borrow a 4Runner? Uh, and they said, sure, and we took it up Imogene Pass and compared it to the Bronco. We also took the Bronco up Red Cone and compared it to what? to the Defender and the Electrified Jeep, and then I also, well, we've just done tons of with it. I, I compared it to a modified Defender off-road and all sorts of craziness. So we've had a lot of experience long-term with not only the Bronco, but the Wrangler and the Forerunner that Toyota lent us. So we're gonna talk about in depth today the pros and the cons of each one, and maybe discuss which one you should buy and why. And if you don't know why we have a Bronco, thank Tim for that, and thank the Ronald McDonald House, which by the way is a great charity, so if you wanna support, you know, a home away from home for sick kids, definitely take a look into that charity. So how do you want to compare these three, what I would say most popular, in some ways the best off-roaders uh, that you can buy today? Well, I think first we need to talk about what they are and just the basic structure of them because they are pretty fundamentally different. So the Ford Bronco and the Jeep Wrangler are available in both two and four door configurations. They are both convertibles and they both have removable doors and all that fun stuff. The 4Runner is only available in a four door configuration with a fixed roof, but we're throwing it into the mix today because a lot of people cross shop the Toyota with the other two. Yeah, uh, and in terms of pricing, uh, of course, uh, they vary. I, I think the, probably the biggest bandwidth is either the Wrangler or the Bronco, the 4Runner, because it, um, you know, it isn't available with multiple engine choices or in different configurations is pretty much set. And we'll talk about pricing in depth here as we continue along our comparison journey. So the first thing you have to decide, in my opinion, is whether or not you want the convertible capability of the Ford or the Jeep because the Toyota is locked in as a hardtop. Uh, you know, you can get a little sunroof in the vehicle, but it's not really a full on open top experience like the other two. So if that's important to you, the Toyota is probably off your list right away. You know, I would, I'm guessing here, but my gut tells me that if you want a foreigner, you want a foreigner. If you want a Bronco, you want a Bronco. If you want a Wrangler, you want a Wrangler. I don't think there's a lot of people out there who are like, hmm, I think I'm going to go test drive all three, which you, by the way, probably can't do because uh, the Bronco is still pretty much unobtainium, right? Uh, the Forerunner has become unobtainium because of the chip slash supply chain issues. Uh, and the Wrangler has also disappeared from the lots. Well, you heard it here first, guys. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. According <laughs> to my dad, if you know what you want, you know what you want. We'll see you next time. No, no, no. I think, <laughs> what does that mean? I think that means that in this, in this uh, uh, podcast, we're going to talk about, look, here's a secret that you guys don't know. Maybe, maybe Tommy knows this, but you guys might not know this. We get a lot of emails from people who want our advice on what they're buying. And over the 11 years that we've been doing this, Tommy, I have figured out the secret. You know what the secret is? That people only want us to reaffirm what they already think. You the know best. the secret. Yeah. yeah. We get an email from people and they say, hey, I'm thinking about buying, let's say it's a forerunner. They don't want, every time I've been like, hey, you know, that's a great choice, but have you thought about you know, a Bronco, or if you thought about a Wrangler, that always makes them very grumpy. What they want me to say, and so I say it is, great choice, here are the reasons why you'll be happy. I think there's a lot of people out there, though, that are genuinely curious which one is the best that fits their needs. And I think that's kind of the whole purpose of doing this video, because the fact of the matter is, they are both incredible in, our, all three of them are incredible in their own respects. It's just the respects that they're incredible in are quite different, and that's what we're gonna help sort out today. So we've discussed kind of the shapes and the sizes. Um, now, if you're looking at the Ford or the Jeep, you're gonna have to decide if you want the two or the four door configuration. And based on what most of you are buying, the vast majority of folks are gonna get the four door. And why the four door over the two door? Because it's practical. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it that is. was that was quite the simple way of saying it. Now, even you can throw into your mom back there, your dog, you got a lot more room for your stuff, right? It's just it's it just fits your and it still does everything the two door does. So you can take the top off. So it's got all the advantages of the two door with all the practicality of a four door. Yeah, but they don't look as good. 
No, they don't. But, you know, looks are subjective. And they're not as easy to park, and they're not quite as good off-road in a lot of situations because of the longer wheelbase. Keep in mind that Tommy just did buy the two-door. Well, yes, because who needs friends and dogs and family? You know what I mean? Wrangler. Uh, <laughs> well, you have all that. Well, I don't have many friends. You do, and you have a dog. Yeah, my mom doesn't often ride in the car because she refuses to get in the back seat. It's a win-win-win. Blaze the puppy loves the back seat. It's perfect. To, to and be, and the four doors are more expensive, and I couldn't afford the four door. Yeah, to be fair, uh, uh, the back seat of a two door Jeep. We have never been in the back seat of a two door Wrangler. You have, I haven't. Uh, is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty bad. So the deal with the back seats on the two doors, both for the Jeep and the Ford, is they are both perfectly adequate when you're back there, and they actually feel pretty roomy. It's just the process of getting into the back seat where the issue lies. And then, of course, you have the smaller truck. But, yeah, I think... Well, if you had a, if you had a convertible and a cherry picker, it'd be easy. Right. Yeah, you, you would you need to... You could bypass that whole trying to get the front seat you know, out of the way and then trying to crawl into that little tiny space that's left when you fold the front seat down and trying to do it in such a way that your private parts either don't show or don't bang on something. Mm, very, very good point. But I think for the purpose of this comparison, we should probably focus on the four-door models because that's what people are going to be buying for the vast majority of, of consumers. Yeah, you know, let, let's do it the typical TFL way. We'll count them down. So let's start with the oldest first. Then we'll talk about the Wrangler, which is the next oldest, obviously, in terms of its model lineup. And then we'll talk about the newest of Bronco. So let's start with the Forerunner, just because... I think that one's been around the longest in its current form. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, we just, like I said, spent a long time with the newest newest version of it. Uh, and, and there are a bunch of good things that it has going over the other models. First and foremost, it's got that incredible four-liter uh, uh, six-cylinder, which I think is one of Toyota's best engines. Okay. Outside of the, you don't agree? What? Well, I mean, it's not it's not fuel it's not fuel efficient. <laughs> it's thirsty, but as a reliable, uh, powerful, and well matched engine to the five speed, this is crazy that I'm saying it. Gearbox that four liter is better than the three point five that's in the Tacoma. So let's talk about the engines. I think that that is a great place to start. The four liter is extremely long lived. You're absolutely right, and that that that's by far one of the biggest selling points of the Forerunner. So it, it's been around not only in the Forerunner, but in the FJ Cruiser and the older Tacomas, and even in certain Land Cruisers in certain parts of the world. So they just go forever. Now, power wise, somewhere around 270 horsepower. Fuel economy wise, figure like mid to high teens. So not a very efficient engine. And uh, if you want, the Forerunner can only, as you mentioned, be made into the five-speed automatic, which in 2021 is kind of archaic. But yes, I do agree with you. From a longevity standpoint, incredible. From a power and performance standpoint, it's not as potent as, for example, some of the Ford or Jeep engines. No, especially up here at a mile above sea level. You know, the Forerunner to me is like an old shoe. It's comfortable. Uh, and it fits, but it's getting a little, oh, shall I say, smelly, Tommy? Uh, just because, once again, a five speed is, uh, I think, I can't, can you think of any other vehicle that you can buy that has a five speed? Um, is there anything else out there with a five speed off the top of my head? Let me know in the comments. There might be. Yeah, actually, yeah, there's uh, some five speed manuals like the Chevrolet Spark. Automatic. Automatic. Oh. No, I don't know if there's any five speed autos. So I. I think that I disagree with you on it feeling smelly because the current generation of Forerunner called the fifth generation. Uh, smelly is a bad, uh, it's a bad analogy, but but you, by smelly, I mean, it's just really dated and long. But I think they've done a phenomenal job. Keep in mind that even though it's going on a decade old, th they've really updated it um, in such a way where the design is phenomenal. I think it's one of the best looking SUVs on the market. The front end, I love the kind of squinty headlights with the angry eyes and the, the big bull to grill. Uh, the interior quality is top notch, probably one of the best in the industry. The technology is not as good as the other two, but it still is pretty decent. And Toyota's done a good job of keeping it relevant, I think, over the years. Um, but one of the reasons I like the Forerunner so much is not only the fact that it'll last forever, but I think it's the best on-road of the three. It just has the most compliant driving dynamics. I think the steering is some of the best. Um, it's the most car-like, and it's the most confident, in my opinion, on a daily commute. You know what really blew me away about the Forerunner? When we took it up Imogene, which is this pretty challenging, it's not, I'd say it's a 5 out of 10 in terms of Colorado mountain passes. It's outside of Ure, and it connects kind of Ure and Telluride. 
Uh, and you get a little bit of everything. There's, you know, and you can watch the video. It's over at TFL Off Road. But what really blew me away about the Forerunner was I was thinking that the Bronco would just run away from it with the 35s. Right? Let's let's face it. Um, the size of the tire is probably the easiest and most important change you can make to a vehicle to make it better off road. So when you go from what's the Forerunner? Is it 33? 32 something it's like some weird size right it's like a 32 yeah so you know that's a substantial difference so i thought that the bronco would just run away from the uh, forerunner and the forerunner did everything the bronco did um uh, i wouldn't say as athletically but it did it uh and it didn't complain it did phenomenal the forerunner is still one of the most capable vehicles out there on the road today and what i like about the toyota is that they're also quite a few number of trims that you can get depending on how much capability you need. So you can get an SR5, you can get a Limited, you can get a TRD Off-Road, you can get a TRD Pro, depending on your budget. And the best one to get is the TRD Off-Road version of the 400 because you get 99% of the pro's capability without having to deal with the markups and the crazy prices that dealers ask for them because they still have the rear locker, they still have the eight track capability and the multi-terrain select and all of that. And they just don't have the fancy shocks of the pro or the cool badging, but it'll still do everything you need it to do. Yeah, you know, uh, my pharmacist bought one, and they ran into one issue with it, which I think is fair to point out. Uh, because of that kind of very complicated design language on the front of it, it's really hard to find uh, a bumper that looks good when you try to change out the front bumper on it. Because there's all this, like, design going on, because you've got all these, like, intersecting curves. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a little tricky to, like, you know, throw a different front bumper on it uh, because of that look that you're talking about, that squinty-eyed, you know, um, angry bird look. Whereas, like, a Wrangler or a Bronco, you just, well, it, Bronco aftermarket parts are just starting to come uh, on the market. But certainly with the Wrangler, you have uh, maybe a 20-minute job to swap out the front bumper. And it looks nice no matter which one you get. So I'm looking at the pricing right now on the SR5 version of the Forerunner. So it is the most expensive starting of the three. $37,000 starting, um, and then you've got tons of different trims. So you've got the SR5, the Trail Special Edition, which I drove pretty recently, SR5 Premium Limited, Tier D Off-Road, Tier D Off-Road Premium, and then the Top Dog Pro, and the Pro starts at 52000 if you want um, kind of the most premium version of the off-road truck. So uh, the one to get, as we mentioned, is the standard Tier D Off-Road, starts at forty one dollars um, and there's a lot of benefits of going Toyota. So, for example, uh, standard Toyota Safety Sense 2.0, yeah. which is a huge deal. So that's all of the safety gear included, including convenience gear like adaptive cruise control um, and all of the, the, the cool autonomous braking features. And that is a huge win for the Toyota. Across the board, they have them. Uh, not a win for Toyota is you have to get one with four-wheel drive because it's one of one of the uh, vehicles that, that you can still get with either two or four-wheel drive. So make sure you get a four-wheel drive one at the, at the minimum. Yeah, don't, don't get the uh, Florida Special. And I, I do agree with you on the interior. Um, certainly, it's, it's not as techy as some of its competition. I think it's still very easy to use, and it's got plenty of tech for 99% of people. It's got, you know, Apple CarPlay and that kind of thing, but it isn't you know, full of massive screens and, and huge mind-blowing technology, but it's very usable. And I wouldn't bother with getting like a limited or a really high-end model with all the fancy gizmos. Just get a standard TRD off-road and go from there. Uh, what's it like to live with, Tommy? You know, first and foremost, for some reason, just like the old FJ, it's got a really loud fan. So if you buy one, you probably know this. Uh, when you start up, you get this incredible like fan sound, which is kind of disconcerting, right? It's like, <laughs> until the thing actually, for some reason, decides that... It doesn't need the fan full on. Uh, and then uh, driving it around town, you know, it's it's comfortable. I think the five-speed transmission does hinder it a little bit on the highway uh, uh, around town. I always feel when I'm in a foreigner around town, like I'm just using a lot of uh, fuel unnecessarily because the fuel economy is pretty poor. Uh, and there's a sense that you're burning a lot of gas to move a lot of vehicle. Is it nimble? No. Uh, is it particularly quick? No. Uh, but does it feel rock solid? Can you see over traffic? Yes. Is it comfortable for uh, you know the passengers and your family? Hell yeah. It's got a lot of room in the back. Uh, the back row is a little tight, but not uncomfortably so. I like the flat uh, surface where you could potentially put your arm. I'm doing the little 
putting my arm out the window thing right now if you're listening to this. Uh, I also like the way that it steers. It doesn't necessarily hunt, uh, which is uh, probably the best steering of, of the entire bunch. What, uh, what do you mean by hunt? Can you explain that? Well, the Bronco with the 35s likes to kind of wander down the road. Okay. Um, uh, the, 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 the transmission uh, does, you know... Um, Yeoman's job of snapping out gears. This is not a sporty vehicle, so if you're looking for something that's going to be rewarding in the canyons, don't look at this vehicle. But if you're looking for something that's very practical and very, uh, I would say, athletically, lifestyle then this is a great, you know, every time I see one, I expect, you know, like a gold to come leaping out the back. <laughs> So speaking of Goldens coming leaping out the back, you can haul around a lot of Goldens in this vehicle too because it does have the highest towing capability of the three, so up to 5,000 pounds. So if that is a consideration if you've got like a little boat or a little camping trailer. The Toyota is uh, the most capable in terms of max towing, which is a big deal because the other two only tow a max of about 3,500, so significantly more. I agree with everything you said. I think that it is a little cumbersome in the city, but very solid. I still think, like you said, steering is the best of the three. The suspension composure is amazing. Now, from an aftermarket standpoint, not maybe quite as large as the Jeep. Still tons of availability in terms of lockers. The bumpers you talked about are hard to modify, but you can still get bumpers. Lifts are all over, wheels and tires, and all those are available as well. Uh, it is a little bit more expensive, in my opinion, than, to modify than a Wrangler, especially from a lifting standpoint, because it's got independent front suspension, but it's very doable. You can create an off-road beast with these things if you want to go that route, or just drive it straight out of the box uh, and enjoy it for what it is, and it will last you a huge hugely long time and you can sell it for a ton of money down the road the resale value is through the roof and you can roll down the rear window which is great for those doggos out there yeah, i was going to say like the, the most thoughtful feature is you can roll down the rear window it's also the easiest one to slap a rooftop tent on <laughs> by, sure uh, the by, fixed roof does have its advantages uh, uh, by far uh and yeah you, you're right it's gonna uh, it's gonna uh, be around probably much longer uh, than the other two in terms of resale value. Uh, even though Wranglers hold their resale value, it's, I think it's truly to say about Broncos because obviously, they, they, you know, very few people. Right now, the resale value is through the roof, but that's not because of the market condition. Well, I mean, it is because of the market conditions, but the market conditions are weird. So I wouldn't take a any kind of take-home lesson from that right now. So I would say cons. Um, the reason I was a little hesitant on the 4-liter is because it is not a very quick vehicle in a straight line. Which is fine. I mean, I would I would sacrifice quickness all day for reliability, but I need to keep in mind that some folks really do do value that that snappiness off the line, and it isn't all that quick. No forced induction, uh, no special direct injection, nothing like that. Just a standard uh, reliable V6 engine. So if you want, if you're coming out of a car and you expect it to be you know zippy from a stop, the Forerunner is not going to be as good as some of the other options on the route. You know, you know what the worst con is. Um, this is a huge one. I'm not talking about the lack of a convertible, but by far the infotainment in the current gen is is at least a generation, maybe even two behind what's in the Wrangler. It works. Well, what do you need in a what do you need in your Forerunner? It's got it, Bluetooth it, audio. It's, it's got a radio. It's tiny. It's like I'm I'm doing my little hand thing here, guys. It's like it's like like a postage stamp compared to the Broncos. Uh, and while the uh, uh, Wrangler isn't, you know. Bigger, uh, it's certainly you connect much more functional, much more functional. Yeah, it's got the old Lexus slash Toyota system, which um, most people will agree uh, is um, uh, cumbersome at best and antiquated. It was antiquated, antiquated at worst. I would Oof. think that's a way to. I, I mean, upset Toyota folks coming your way, Dad. Well, uh, you know, people will use such words as garbage to describe it. No. Oh yeah, it's, tech people will use that word, Tommy. I have heard that word used. How big do you think the screen is? Uh, let's see. What size is the postage stamp? Like an, a quarter of an inch? What is, <laughs> no, no. Seriously, how how big do you think the screen is? I, I don't know. Is it like uh, it's either going to be seven or nine inches? It's eight inches. No, oh, I was right. But, okay, which between. is only 0.4 of an inch smaller than the biggest screen you can get on a Wrangler. So it's about the same size yeah, as the Yeah, but what's the size screen. of the screen on the Bronco? Well, the stock one, I think, is 8 inches, too. What's, what's the... what? Uh, that one is, what, 10 something. inches? 14. Think, no. Oh, yeah. No, it yeah, isn't. It I is. don't believe it. It is. It is. I it's think like it's, 14 I think it's a tenner. It's a 14-er, dude. Maybe a 12. Uh-huh. I think it's a 14-er. Let's see here. He's going to have to back trick me. 12 inches. It's not a 14-er. <laughs> I actually did... So they updated the, the uh, screen in the 
a forerunner pretty recently, I think is pretty good. By the way, there's a, it's so good that they created an entirely different system Toyota has. You know that, right? It was in the uh, Tundra I just drove. So Toyota, in fact, uh, created an entire separate group that's made up of hundreds of employees to create an entire new, you can, well, I think they call it, is it in, in tunes the old one, I think. Uh, an entire new system because they even they realized that their uh, system was not very good. So, if and, so and that's that's going to be in the tundra, I think, first and foremost. If you are not 95 years old like my dad, you'll just plug in Apple CarPlay and just use it like everybody else, and then it doesn't matter how easy it is. It be, yeah, plug, it, that, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, you can then you plug in use, Apple CarPlay into any of these. No, you use Apple CarPlay and you just forget the rest of it. Until you run out of cell service and then you have no navigation. Well, no, it'll still go as long as you're still. Is if you're what using, you're if, I guess if you're using our friends Look, at Onyx, then I you're actually, all set and you download the map. I am actually the 95 year old here, and I think that being 95, the buttons and the uh, the simplicity of having the shortcuts on the side of the screen and the freaking volume knob oh, for, makes this one of the best systems oh God, around. It's, actually, it's, it's, it's just, I'm going it's in so, the other direction. It's so, it's so bad. The functionality is. Like like turn of the century compared to some of the newer turn stuff of the century. Out, it's stuff fine. Out there. It's an off roader. What do you need a big screen for? All right. Anyway, I, I'm just saying. You know, infotainment is becoming more and more important because we spend all of our time staring into our devices and staring, Isn't that staring, depressing? Into, staring into that thing. Certainly makes you want to not stare into a device. Just look out the window. Uh, uh, what, enjoy how, many, the how many colors does it have? Like two? No, it's, it's like blue and gray. I think so, Dad. I think you're thinking of the old display. No, I'm thinking of the current one. The Trust new me. one is really pretty good. It's got 15 speakers, by the way, if you get the, the JBL audio system, which is pretty amazing. It's an 8-inch screen, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, uh, XM capability. Like, it's fine. I don't the know. best thing I can say about it is it's boxy. Did it did it like offend you in some way? Was there like a no, message no, that popped just, up just, that's just like it's just cumbersome, unintuitive, and boxy. Com compared to the new one, which you haven't seen, which I have, right? You have not. I've driven. Does it have buttons on the side of it? I, I can't talk about its embargo, so, <laughs> so, so I, can't, I can't. Look, to be brutally honest, Dad, I actually I, it's going to be in the NX too. I much prefer having these old systems with physical hard touch. Yeah, buttons. you like the you like the original U Connect too, right? The one that was like green and had like you know four boxes. I on like it. the original Toyota system too. That was like something out of 1990 because it just worked. All right, like it doesn't need to be fancy. Just we, make we, it work. We beat that dog beyond beating. Uh, let's move on to the next vehicle, and this is going to be a little bit trickier because with Toyota, you basically get one engine choice and two transmissions with the Wrangler one, one transmission in Toyota oh that's right yeah no more for mm -hmm. yeah one tra so one engine one transmission with the with the Wrangler you get two transmissions you've got the manual I should point out uh, and an automatic and how many engine choices are there can you can you read them off the top of your are there five yes well or six? I've, I've got the configurator in front of me because I yeah. don't want to mess it up but there's a number of them so at the base end of the spectrum um, you've got a choice of either a 3.6 liter V6 or a uh, two liter turbocharged engine. So those are gonna be more of your two entry level ones. There's also a 3.6 liter V6 with something called eTorque, which is a mild hybrid system. Then there's the option for a three liter diesel engine, which is pretty cool. On top of that, there's also a plug-in hybrid, which is called the 4xe, so that's a two liter and a big battery. And then at the top end of the spectrum is a 6.4 liter Hemi V8. All right, uh, I'm going to cut to the chase here. I'll give you guys Roman's quick guide to which Wrangler you want. If you want uh, a reliable, basic transportation Wrangler, get the one that Tommy got by far with the 3.6, the Willys. That gets you as much of the off-road goodies as you can with a cool kind of raccoon blacked out grill. Uh, and it's affordable. I think you paid, what, 33 for years? Yep. All right, then let's go up. If you want to be um, green uh, and you want to go off-roading without any motor sound, actually engine sound, uh, and you want probably what used to be the most affordable one in a way because you got the biggest rebate, definitely go by the go get the 4 by e uh, It's also the most complicated, so it's probably the one that's going to cause you the most grief if things go wrong. If you are going to build your vehicle up uh, and you want to roll on like, I don't know, 40s, probably get the diesel because it's just got astounding amounts of torque. Uh, it's also probably the one that if you're going to road trip it, it's going to be the most um, efficient. Uh, and then if you want the coolest badass boy of the bunch, get yourself uh, the Hemi. There you go. That's my take on which engine. Very well done. I think that I'd make it even simpler. And That's I'd a V8, say, by the way, the Hemi. 
Yeah, the V8 is the 6.4. Yeah. Um, I think most people should probably just get the, the standard Pentastar V6. If you want the manual transmission, by the way, you have to get the standard Pentastar V6. Um, I think it does, once again, it's not very snappy. So if you're looking for sports car-like experience, get the hybrid or the diesel or the V8. But if you're looking for a Wrangler-like experience, just get the V6. It's been around for nine years now. It's proven itself to be pretty darn solid, actually, even though people are going to throw things at me in the comment section. It's true. I was just talking to some master techs, and they said that they see him consistently with over 200,000 miles. I think people don't give that Pentastar enough credit. I think given give it another five years, and people are going to look back on that, like that four-liter straight six that was in the old Wranglers, right? Uh, as one of the most reliable, one of the best uh, engines that well, was let's, produced. Well, let's not get too crazy here. Right. Let's not let's not right. make too big of an assumption there. Uh, all right. So if you want the jack of all trades, this is how go get the Forerunner. It's you know it'll, it's good going to the grocery store. It's good going off road. If you want the one that's going to scream in a very loud way, I am a very active, cool person that loves driving around with the top down uh, and that maybe goes off-road occasionally or goes off-road all the time, get the Wrangler. It, it's certainly much more to the off-road side of the equation. It's out of the, even, even out of the three, while the, the Bronco is also very off-roady, uh, the Wrangler, for some unbeknownst reason, is the most popular Wrangler ever. They sell like a quarter million units a year, right? Which is a lot, 250,000. But at the same time, it is the most singly focused off-roader of the bunch. There's no compromises in the Wrangler to on-road performance, be it aerodynamics, it's like pushing a brick into the wind, be it the tires, uh, be it you know the design language. This is a 100% off-road focused vehicle. You know The fact that people don't take it off-road all the time doesn't matter. It still is the one that, like I say, makes no compromises. So I can't disagree with you because people in the comment section say I disagree too much. Okay. So I'm going to say I appreciate that feedback. Um, I, I mean, I get there's a Sahara version, which is supposed to be the city <laughs> slicker version of a Wrangler. Maybe what I'll do rather than disagree It is, still has solid axles. It still has... I'll add to that discussion by a, saying... A low-range transfer case. Look, I'll add to that discussion by saying that even though you are right that it does have, you know, a lot of traditional off-road gear... It is not the wheelbarrow on the road that a lot of people will have you believe. I'm not saying it's a wheelbarrow. I, I never said that. I said it's the most uncompromising off-roader, right? I didn't say it was. There is one There is one aspect in which it's a wheelbarrow, and that is, of course, the seating position and the seats. And they are just downright um, pretty miserable. You can't get far enough away from the upright windscreen, and there's no lumbar support, and the seat in general provide less than zero support for your lower back. So the JL uh, Wrangler, which is the current generation of Wrangler, it's called JL, was introduced a few years ago for the 2018 model year, and it brought pretty significant improvements over previous generations of Jeep for on-road comfort. So uh, I think a lot of folks are still thinking of Jeeps as they were built in like the 1980s or 1990s, which is to say with leaf springs and like short... Like the square headlight. Yeah, like short wheelbases. Like and Very, very, very firm. Like a YJ. Sorry. Like a YJ, yeah. yeah. But the new ones, especially with th four doors, and if you don't get a Rubicon, like if you get a Sahara or a Sport, they're really not terrible on the road. I do agree that of the three, it still is the most compromised. And the areas where it's most compromised from a dynamic standpoint is the steering. Very kind of primitive and very, um, I mean, it's just not very precise. I think it's still a recirculating ball. And there's a lot of kind of deadness now, on keep center. Keep in mind, you said compromise. I said uncompromised off-roader. But I'm saying, I'm saying like on you, the road, you it is. You flipped it to the other side of the coin. On the road, it is. But the issue is, I think, is you, you, you can't talk about the Wrangler um, as being an off-roader because while it is incredible off-road, the vast majority of the time it's spent on the road. Right? And I think this podcast is going to appeal to people that also want to like take their kids to school and not just go hit the trail. So I think we need to talk about the, the flip side of the coin, too. And yes, it is an amazing four-wheel drive off-roader, easily one of the best in the world. I mean, there's, there's another vehicle that manages to pull off the same feet as well. You know what that is. What is that? Uh, that's a G-Wagon. That's also pretty much an uncompromising off-roader. Uh, you know, with three locking divs and, you know, a design language that yells, uh, I'm a military uh, vehicle, and yet it's the most popular for a certain set of people who will drive it down, you know, Hollywood Boulevard and never take it anywhere near 
someplace where there's no pavement. And, and, yet, I and think, yet that's also I think at, the same feet. At one point that was the case, but I think that the G-Wagon has gone in a very different direction. I think that it is now an extremely compromised off-roader with all of the cladding on the side with 22-inch wheels. I mean, it even comes, it even comes from the factory with a roll, not a roll bar, uh, uh, like a push bar on the front. But I think a lot of that is just visual aid. I don't think you'd actually want to run that into a tree. And on 22-inch wheels and side pipes, it really is not like a Wrangler in a lot of ways. So the Wrangler has rocker protection. It's got high-profile uh, tires for off-road driving. So all of that adds to its you know, relatively compromised on-road ability. But I will say, if you can get past the steering, the ride is pretty good. The hard top is pretty darn quiet. Um, the brakes are very confidence expiring. It has, you know, more modern safety gear. It's got airbags and, and traction control and ABS and that kind of thing. It's not like it's the 1980s. And I, I also think it's got the nicest interior of the three. Uh, I yeah, I, I they, completely I agree. They really stepped it up. I think by far the nicest in terms of the design, the style, the materials, you know, anything you use to, to, to kind of... Uh, review what an interior should be, uh, the Wrangler by far is the nicest. Not the most comfortable, the nicest. I also think that it's potentially the worst value in a lot of ways. So the starting MSRP is low. It's under $30,000, well, right around 29000 starting. But keep in mind, for twenty nine grand, you don't get power windows or power mirrors or power locks or any well, of that kind of standard stuff. Well, there is a thing called the Jeep tax, Tommy, right? And that's what you're, whether it's a Wrangler, which it's the highest of, but it, it, it's also in every Jeep. What you're paying for is the name. Right. Right. And so, yeah, value-wise, you know, if you value the name, then you're probably willing to pay for the Jeep tax, and that's probably... Realistically, a couple thousand dollars well, or keep more. A, keep in mind, I mean, we're it's talking... not a real number, but you know, it, it's if you compare like three similar spec vehicles, the Jeep is going to be more expensive just because it's a Jeep. Rubicon 392, if you get the top dog 6.4, that starts at nearly $75,000. So what I think you'll find is that most Jeeps that you see in the lot are going to fall between like forty five dollars and $55,000. So right around the $50,000 territory, be it Sahara or Rubicon, that seems to be kind of where most of them fall into nowadays. Now for fifty dollars $45,000, you, you do get leather, which is good. You do get 8.4 inches of touchscreen display typically. Uh, you do get the amazing four-wheel drive system and Rubicons do have locking diffs and um, sway bar disconnects and all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of the times these do not come equipped with the same level of safety gear that the Toyota include, which is a big deal. So it is possible to get like adaptive cruise control, but you're going to have to pay quite a bit for that depending on the trim, whereas it would be standard in Toyota. Same thing with like blind spot alert and that kind of deal. Yeah, you know, and look, here's the, th uh, let me, let me kind of sum up again what a Jeep Wrangler is like on road, all right. Uh, so it's 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 highly uncompromising off road, which means by definition, it's like you said, it's compromised on road. But all of that doesn't really, I think, matter because when you pull up next to the guy or gal in your Wrangler with the top down that's sitting below you, which they are in a seventy thousand seven series or ninety thousand dollar S class, you will always be the cooler of the two. And I think that's what matters to a lot of people, right? They know that you can bring this. Maybe another way that you can you could you could say this is you could, you could take a Wrangler to the beach, or you could take it to the most exclusive of of clubs, golf clubs, beach clubs, whatever kind of club you want, and that Wrangler will be at home there, and it will never be out of its element. Uh, and that is something uh, that is a very difficult trick to achieve. Uh, because it's what it says about you is uh, that you're active and cool and you know at the same time not snooty and not you know what I mean not not like uh, trying to live above your station uh, and once again I think that is what is magical about that vehicle in terms of its kind of public image and in terms of the image that you're putting out. And the other thing about it is it's kind of lovable, right? I, I've known a lot of people who have at some point gotten tired of Wranglers, which you will do. Right, it's it, it's not the most comfortable. It's not the quietest. It's certainly not the most performing. And then when you ask them, what's the vehicle you regret selling? Inevitably, it's always, oh, that Wrangler I had back when I was whatever. Yes, as long as it was not a Wrangler from the 1980s, in which case it was always broken. <laughs> but yeah, maybe not. All right, let's go. Let's go like TJ, JK, and JL. I think the the YJ with the square headlight one, maybe not so much, and the CJs. Uh, I don't know. Those are tractors. So, uh, the other speaking of reliability too, I know that people 
the first impression is to go give it hell because yes, in the past Jeep, Jeep has done some vehicles which are less than uh, high quality, but I talked to a lot of Wrangler owners in this job, and I mean a lot of them with 50, 100, 150,000 miles, even on the JL Wranglers, and people are very impressed with its long-term capability, especially with that base V6 that we were talking about. There just really isn't all that much to go wrong in the grand scheme of things. They're very durable, um, very kind of simple in their overall design, and people really rag on them with pretty good results. There's, there's not a huge amount that will go wrong. So, for example, like the early ones, people um, always point to the, the, the frame welds, right, which had some issues. But that was like an early production thing. I think a lot of those issues have been sorted now that we're a few model years in. And people, for the most part that I talked to, super pleased with the long-term capability and longevity. Now, talking about technology and infotainment, um, there are three different screens, and you want to talk about postage stamp. You should see the screen that I have in my Wrangler. It is about the size of a finger. Um, it's a five-inch display, I think, officially, but uh, most of them are going to have a seven-inch or an 8.4-inch display. Yeah, and I think Uconnect is one of the better systems in the business. It's intuitive, and especially the newest, I think the 5.0 version, that's not in the Jeep, unfortunately, that's in like the new Pacifica, uh, is mind-blowingly good. Uh, but even the current system in the Jeep actually works really well. I, I have no issues. The only issue we ever had with it was if you have satellite radio and you have a soft top convertible and you fold the soft top down, right, that front part, it covers up the antenna sometimes and you lose... Uh, you lose uh, satellite radio. And speaking of tops, there's a number of different options. There's a soft top, there's a premium soft top, there's a hard top, and there's a power top as well. And it seems like a lot of people are going for the power top, which is interesting because it's very expensive. But the power top... I believe 4K or 4.5K. The power top, you just push a button and this whole fabric section slides back. You don't have to get out and undo latches and that kind of thing just to put it down. Push a button and it's all automatic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, once again, most customizable, upgradable, modifiable vehicle in uh, maybe the entire automotive world? Parts are very gettable, tons and tons can, of manufacturers. Can you think of anything that is easily modifiable as a Wrangler? Um, and has as many like aftermarket. I can't think of maybe anything Maybe like else. a Mustang. They've got a pretty pretty good following. Yeah, but this is just like bolt and play, right? With the Wrangler, you just unbolt the rear and front bumper and bolt on a new one. It's it's super easy. And then because it's solid axles, lifting it is super easy too, right? People do love that. And, um, you know, you've, you've got not tens of choices of lift manufacturers, but hundreds. And they range from all sorts of different price points from, you know, under a grand all the way up to tens so, of thousands of dollars. So what's it like to live with? You just drove yours to the airport and back. Well, is that the new standard now, the uh, the airport test? Yeah, it's a good standard because that's kind of that's the uh, ultimate of living with something when you're driving a car to the airport and using it as a, as an airport commuter. That is that is way outside of its comfort zone. No, it's been great. I've had it for a few months now. Um, the headlights are very bad and the seats are very bad. <laughs> so if you're going to get one, make sure to get the LED headlights. But apart from that, like it's fine. It, it's pretty quick, especially the two-door with the manual transmission is actually really kind of a hot rod. Super fun to drive. The manual transmission is awesome. Um, surprisingly quiet, even with the soft top. Uh, the radio is excellent, even in the very base configuration like I have. I mean, I think power locks would have been a good option to get. But apart from that, it does absolutely everything I needed to. My friends love it. Um, they're young enough to get into the back seat. I love folding the oh, top Oh, thanks. Back. Now you're making it an age thing. <laughs> it is an age thing. It's not an age thing. It's an age thing. No, it, it, it's a keeping your private parts uh, not on display thing. You, well, have, apparently, you have to contort yourself into like a pretzel to get in the back seat. It's well, not about age. It's about like, dude, this is like very weird getting well, back here. Well, their joints and their private parts are young enough to contort oh, themselves to get back there. But uh, the trunk is pretty small. That's kind of another complaint with the two-door. And, and the headlights, if you get the LEDs, easily stolen. I think there's like three screws. People that, do steal in LED LA, headlights. They're front and rear ones, unfortunately. But like, it's fantastic. I'm getting good mileage in mine because it's small and lightweight. I'm getting 21 miles per gallon, mm -hmm. uh, which is really and, pretty decent. And how do you like the manual compared to the auto? It's great. Um, the automatic is an eight-speed, and that's what most people should get. But the manual transmission is a great option. Six-speed. Uh, gearing is a little too tall, so I'm never really in six gear. But uh, four-wheel drive system is excellent. There's no reason to get a Rubicon. If you're going to get um, a Wrangler for off-roading, I strongly recommend just get the Willys or the Willy Sport. People, Be people get the Rubicon for the name. Yeah, they do. But you really don't need the lockers because the LSD and the brake lock differential system just 
phenomenal. They work so incredibly well. Like you've mentioned earlier, it is a, it is just a no compromise off-road machine, even in the very base model configurations. Um, but yeah, I'm really, really pleased with it. Uh, seats aren't very good. Um, and the headlights like we talked about, but the ride is pretty good. Uh, believe it or not, I can take highway turns at 7580. Without rolling over? Without rolling over and crashing into a bush. That's never happened to me once. And I have USB ports, which I use. Uh, even with my little postage stamp screen, plug it in, listen to the radio. And it's, it's the other thing about a Wrangler is it's, you know, this, this word is way overused, especially in press releases, but it's not precious. It's rugged. So, you know, if it rains inside of the thing, it's not going to hurt it. Yeah, exactly. It's got cloth seats and you can get tan cloth seats, which is good. And yeah, I'm super happy with it. And I'm glad, like, it's it's not uncommon to see Wranglers, especially in the press fleets that are 63, 65 grand. Don't do that. Just get one for 35 grand. You're going to have 95% of the experience. Sure, you're not going to have a heated steering wheel, but it will uh, still put a big smile on your face. And, yeah, it's good. All right. Now wait, let's skip to the one that people have been probably most curious about, and that is the Bronco. Not right. the Bronco Sport, mind you, right? That's the one that's uh, based on the Escape. Oh, no, I said Escape. Yeah, Escape. You're good. Yeah, uh, but the Bronco. Uh, so keep in mind that ours is a first edition, so it's got all the bells and whistles. 63K, 35s from the factory. Uh, Ford calls it orange. We call it yellow or gold. Uh, came with a hard top that sounded like there were little elves mining for treasure above my head, which Ford has now recalled, and hopefully they'll send us a new one. So we swapped out the uh, soft top on it, which sol solved that problem, even though it is a little louder on the highway you can really you, you always you know what when, when i get in the thing i love the best stuff the quality is great but because it's such a large area to cover for uh, a soft top every time you get in it and you start driving you kind of feel like there's a window open you know you know that feeling you know what i mean you're like looking around like is there a window open and it turns out it's just you know a very big soft top it is a big soft top uh, you're, you're spot on with that so bronco just like the wrangler can be had in so many different configurations but only two engine choices only two engine choices, but pricing-wise, that we're talking, you know, like high twenties all the way up to the sixty thousand dollar range. So just like the the Jeep, whew, you can go just crazy with the options depending on how you want to spec so, it. So ours has the uh, two point seven twin turbo out of the F one fifty, puts out just over three hundred horsepower. Uh, it's a good engine, you know. Uh, I've always loved that engine. It's uh, because of the way this Bronco is geared with the thirty fives. In the F-150, it's super quick. It's like the dragster of the F-150 range. Here, not so much, but that's okay. If you're buying a Bronco to be a dragster, you're probably buying the wrong vehicle. Uh, it does spin those tires really well. It doesn't suffer at highways for lack of power or speed. And off-road, it's certainly very powerful. I don't know about the four-cylinder. I would think if you try to like upgrade the four-cylinder uh, with uh, a lift and bigger wheels and tires, you might find it to be a little bit anemic. So I drove the four cylinder actually in, yeah, in Texas and you can get both transmissions with a 10 speed automatic but mm -hmm. if you want the manual you have to get the four cylinder and it's a seven speed manual which is very very cool it's got a crawler gear. Yeah it's like a Porsche 911. I think the manual transmission in the Bronco is even better than the one in the Ford but the only way I would get a... Wait, uh, wait, you said Bronco is better than the one in the Ford. You mean Wrangler? Sorry, the Bronco is better than the one in the Jeep, okay. exactly. Um, I just, it's a little crisper, and it's, uh, I do like that and crawler. And you get the crawler, here. yeah. But um, if you're going to get the four-cylinder, the only reason to get the four-cylinder, my opinion, is for the manual, because otherwise I think the V6 is going to be better for most folks in um, just about every configuration. So... Um, Biggest difference between the two is independent front suspension as opposed to a solid axle on the Bronco. Yep, and I think that does make it better on the road, especially expansion joints at speed. It is much more composed and not quite as good as the 4Runner in my opinion. It's not quite as uh, well damped. Um, yeah, I agree with that. So, uh, And there seems to be more body roll in the Toyota. So if you want, strictly from an on-road driving standpoint, the Toyota is going to be the best, but the Ford is better than the Jeep. Yeah, I agree with that. But let's face it, none of these are you know razor sharp canyon carvers if you're looking for that you're probably looking at the wrong market segment right i think the value is better on the ford than the jeep so it starts at 28.5 but you get standard power windows agreed except that dealers are just you know uh, a lot of them are being greedy and are if you can get one so last the numbers are pretty interesting last month ford uh i think they built 3900 uh, broncos and they sold like 3900 of them just short of a few uh, so there's not a lot of them out there and they're still 
uh, very hard to get, and I think dealers are taking advantage of that. And you can see them being resold for like 20, 25K over sticker. Right, but standard power windows, uh, power locks, that kind of thing is nice to have. Um, and you get an eight inch screen as standard too with the optional 12 inch screen. And that 12 inch screen is pretty phenomenal. So if you're into technology, uh, especially when you've got the front facing camera going, it does look really, really good. So that is a big pro with the Ford. I think a big con with the Ford is uh, the interior is just kind of chintzy. It just does not feel good. I don't think it looks very good. The materials we touch uh, feel kind of bargain basement apart from the seats. There, there is cost cutting on the interior, especially, you know what, the one that the one that really always gets me, when you open up that center armrest, yep. uh, there's that little like tray. That tray looks like a piece of throwaway plastic that you would get in a piece of packaging for like, you know, uh, I don't know, like a like a hard drive. Yeah, and I think like the material down by the shifter is just terrible. And I know people are going to comment, well, it's an off-roader. Why do you care about the interior? I care about the interior because I think like having quality and having off-road ability are not mutually exclusive. You should be able to have both in one. And I'm not convinced that that thing's going to hold up long term from an interior standpoint. Uh, now, from an engineering standpoint and a capability standpoint, uh, Ford has done something pretty cool. They offer something called the Sasquatch package, which allows you to get the big tires and the locking differentials. Um, Jeep does that now too. The across the board. What do they call it? The Recon. The uh, yeah, ultimate. they've got the 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 new 35 inch tall tire package. Yeah, Ultimate uh, Recon. Extreme Recon. Recon. Extreme Recon. But I th think Ford forced them to do that. Yeah, but they're not quite going all enchilada because, for example, on the Bronco, you can get a very base model and still get it with lockers and the big tires. Whereas on the Jeep, to get lockers, you gotta go to the Rubicon. So what's it like to live with a, a Bronco? Uh, well, there's good and bad. Uh, let's do the bad first. Uh, the, 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 the top debacle was, uh, you know, not grand. Uh, you know, you're getting a brand new vehicle and then finding out that you've got a, you've got a colony of dwarfs living above your head was not ideal. And, and we're very lucky in that we have connections so we were able to quickly swap out the top for a soft top but if you didn't have those connections i think that would get very annoying uh, the other very annoying thing about the bronco uh and this is <laughs> really annoying is and we haven't fixed this yet um is when you're commuting with it at some point uh the hvac system will turn on full like completely and you will no longer be able to control the fan speed it just it, it, with air conditioner or heater it just goes to number 10, uh, and then you try to control the, and this could be a specific to our Bronco, or it could be something that other Broncos have had. Let us know in the comments below. Uh, and the only way to stop it is to completely turn off the AC or the heater, just, you know, turn off. And then if you turn it back on, it goes once again to full. And then hopefully if you recycle it, if you actually, but if you're on the highway, you don't want to pull over and stop. But if you're uh, like, you know, going to grocery shopping, when you come back, it fixed itself, but it's pretty freaking annoying. Yeah, but I think part of the Studad is what we talked about, like with the Jeep, where it's a first year thing, right? I think there's going to be some kinks that need to be worked out over time. I've seen like people having leaking A pillars and Broncos. Well, and there's also a recall right now on the Bronco for the airbag. They were packed wrong, apparently. So, you know, Ford is having its teething issues. Right. But speaking of airbags, I think you get more standard safety equipment in the Bronco than the Ford, or than the Jeep, which is a, a nice touch. Um, and uh, I, they've done a really good job with this Ford. Look, for, for me, the Bronco is is just much more comfortable uh, as a daily driver. Well, the seats are so much better. Because the leg room's better. It's got electric seats, right? They're electric. Whoa. For a $63,000 vehicle, I'm saying that, but, you know, and it has lumbar support. Mm -hmm. You know, those are, the, you know, the, like, the, there's this saying, like, Japanese designers say, what's the most important part of a vehicle? Uh, and the answer is the door handle because it's your first impression, the first thing you touch. For me, it's a seat because it's where I spend most of the time. And if the seat's not comfortable, we just had this conversation over breakfast this morning. We, I would love to get a Miata, but I, I have to like, like curl myself into uh, an armadillo-sized ball to get in the thing. So as much as I love the vehicle, I could never drive it. I agree. As a road tripper, the, the Ford is far superior than the Jeep. And I mean, it's, it's, I would say in the rock crawling situation, it's just as capable, if not just as capable. I don't know. They're 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 like neck and neck with each other. When you talk about lockers and sway bar yeah. disconnects, it becomes about like like size, right? Like like the Jeep might be a little bit more agile because it feels a little bit narrower, whereas the Bronco is a little bit wider. But in terms of just 
pure capability, they're both exceptional. So uh, one thing I don't like about the Ford is you can't get it with rear AC vents, which is a problem if you have kids or really fuzzy dogs like me who's always hot. So that's kind of a bummer. Other weird thing is you can't get the soft top in the two-door currently, which was a big buying decision for me. Um, you can't get a power top in the Ford either. So in the Jeep, you can get a power top. Can't get a diesel. Can't get a diesel. You can't get electric. Can't get a plug-in hybrid. Um, towing capacity is the same between the Ford and the Jeep, both 3500. Um, yeah, Ford has really done a lot of good stuff with the Bronco. The tech is good. The, the seat comfort is good. Um, fuel economy, we're getting, what, mid to high teens? Yeah. But it's got the 35-inch tall tires. Yeah, which we're, is, we're not, it's not grand. I think... It's a little bit better than TRX, but not much. Oh, headlights are way better. Standard LED headlights on the Ford as well, which is Even the cool. base model? Even on the very base model. Hmm. Yeah, so that, I like I like those little controls for the lockers. I think they're actually easier to use. So with the Jeep, you got to shift it into four low, and then you got to shift it into... Uh, uh, well, it's four automatic, then four low. Uh, with the Bronco, it's just a little round thing that you... And I was using it. I just went up. Uh, oh, just, not the lockers. You mean just the shift selector? Yeah, shift selector. Yeah. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, I just went up uh, Argentine Pass with it compared to the TRX and a side by side. Uh, I actually found um, that uh, Goat mode, greatest of all, goes over any terrain. Actually, uh, really easy to use, right? So if you if you put it in like rock crawl mode, it automatically shifts into four. Low. low, right, and allows you to lock the rear diff, and I think it, I think it locks the rear diff for you, so it does all this. And I got to tell you that turn assist, Tommy, is really good. So we were going up Argentine Pass, and at the, you've been up there, right? The very last serpentine where you make a, like a left turn is a really tight turn, and then there's like a, a cliff there, uh, and it's a very hard turn to make. And with that, uh, you know, the the rear wheel uh, drag, it just it just pirouetted around that turn like it was nothing and it made it so much easier to pick my line going up over that shelf than if I had to like normally if you didn't have that you'd have to kind of make the turn as tight as possible then back up then go forward back up and it would be just much more difficult to pick your line. Other things to keep in mind, which is a good and a bad, is interior volume feels a lot bigger. It does. Feel, I'm not sure it is bigger, but it feels bigger. Feels. I think it's bigger. I, I want to get that exact number, and I'm sorry, I should have looked it up. But um, that the, the the negative of of that is that it does feel like a, almost a class bigger than the Jeep, and it's it's much harder to maneuver in smaller spaces. And especially like garages, if you get the 35s, you're going to want to make sure that it fits in your garage. Um, not only height, but kind of width and length. It's a, it's a very, very large vehicle. So it's also a much heavier vehicle than the Jeep. So I looked at like my comparative Jeep to a Bronco, and it's several hundred pounds heavier, uh, which is not necessarily a good thing off-road as, as um, I mean, weight is the enemy of everything in every situation. So that is definitely worth taking into consideration as well. And then, as you mentioned, Dad, you just... Even though they, they've been on the market for months and months and months, they're still very difficult to find. So um, if you do see them at dealers, they're typically going to have a big markup. People are still waiting even a year later or a year and a half later to get their hands on the one that they, they, they placed way back when. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough time to be in the market for a full-size Bronco. Uh, and a couple other things which, you know, uh, you know we're always transparent. Uh, so we we had to actually get an extension, and this could be COVID related. I don't know, or it could be the dealership. We had to get an extension in our temporary place because the dealer in two months was unable to get us the paperwork to actually register it. Was that from their end, or was that with Ford? Was that an issue with? That was a dealer issue. Okay, well that's not Ford's fault. That that's the dealer's fault, right? Yeah, I, I'm just being transparent. I'm not blaming anybody. Right. I'm just I'm just stating a fact. Uh, you know, it, it, to get. A registration here in Colorado is very hard at this moment in time. You can you, you know that better than I do. You can spend hours at the DMV trying to do it, uh, and then to go there twice uh, because uh, the dealer is unable to actually get the right paperwork to the DMV is is a huge waste of time and very frustrating. We're all you know we're all we're all struggling with COVID, and you know then to have to go through that bureaucratic mess twice and not have the plates yet just to get an extension is, is not not grand dude uh the other thing i would say is uh, aftermarket support is not there yet of course although uh, it's coming in a big way it's coming but huge it's not there. amounts of companies working hard on on, on but parts. I, I think realistically you're probably gonna 
be at least a year before um, it's going to be like like as easy as a Jeep or a Four Runner. At least a year, if not more. But keep it well. There's, I mean, if you want to make if you want to make it your own, right, right, because I, I've been actually trying. You know, with ours, the next step probably is to build it up, and I've been looking around for parts, and they're not out there yet. Maybe with SEMA coming up, they'll announce them. But the other problem is, even if they if the company says they've they've designed them, getting them is a whole different ball of wax. So in terms of specs and options, the one to get, in my opinion, is called the Black Diamond. That's basically the equivalent of the Jeep Wrangler Willys, but it's all the off-road gear, cool steel wheels. It's got rubberized floors, by the way, big pro of the Ford, which you can't do in Jeep, is the rubber floors. Love that. Um, there's also the luxury one, which is called the Outer Banks, and then you've got like the Rubicon competitor, the, ones, the Badlands. The ones I see everywhere are Badlands. For some reason, that seems to be like the, like the SR5 in in the tundra it's the one that's kind of the middle i disagree i the one i see everywhere is called the um uh out uh the the big bend which is kind of the sr5 oh okay so the so the big bend is near the base model and that's the one that dealers for some reason are being allocated um but the wild track and the badlands are more of the rubicon competitors hmm. so they've got the big tires and all the metal bumpers and off-road gear but they did a phenomenal job with the ford and uh if you want to wait for one great if not the Jeep and the Forerunner are great options as well. Um, you can take the doors off of the, the Bronco, just like the Wrangler. The, the biggest thing right now to having a Bronco is it's still pretty cool, right? So when we take ours out, you feel special driving it because you don't see a lot of them out there, and people still come up to you and ask about it. Uh, uh, and that's really, you know, a big fun factor, I think, because you've got the newest, coolest you know, toy on the block. If you've got a Wrangler, it's just, you know, it's been around forever and people don't notice it. It's just part of the scenery. But the Bronco does stand out a lot. That'll change, obviously, as Ford builds more of them. That shine will wear off. But right now, that's, that, that's a big part of it. I think for a lot of people, so maybe that's why people are willing to pay so much over sticker to get them. It could be, Dad. I think that people do want the latest and the greatest. So uh, let us know what you guys think in the comment section below. Uh, which one would you get, Dad, if you had to go buy one right now? <sighs> Okay, it depends what part of my life I was in, right? Well, your current part of your life. Uh, that's a, that's a that's a tough one because I, look, I I, I I have this weird job as as do you, right? So my perspective is going to be very skewed. Uh, it's not going to be a typical person's perspective, right? I don't look at this thing in a typical. So so I I almost feel like if I were to give you an answer. It, it would be it would not be typical because most people in my position don't have the opportunity to drive any car that they want uh, um, so because, okay. we, because we get them from the Denver press fleet. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an answer though. I think if I I wouldn't get the Forerunner. Sorry, Toyota, love it, but it's old and it's not. I'm not in that part of my life. If I had a young family, we had a Forerunner when you were a baby. We had a Forerunner, perfect vehicle for that. It, it it was you know you could use it to commute to work. It, to me, right now, vehicles obviously are more uh, for kind of toy use than they are for for living use. So if you want something you want to live with. Uh, definitely, I would get the foreigner. That's the one. Now, then it becomes what? What toy do I want? Do wait, I want? Wait, if you want one to live with, definitely get the foreigner. Like, like, like live and use with as a daily driver oh, every day. It's your okay. only. You know, it's the one you're going to take. You know, I, I have a choice of all these vehicles I can drive. So if I need to go to the, if I feel like I need to go to the airport, I've got a vehicle. If I want to drive around town, not use an energy, I've got a vehicle. Right, an electric vehicle. So, but if I was, so for me at my point in my life, I'm looking for like a fun toy, right? Something that's going to be. Uh, 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 as used not as a daily driver, but as like a fifth car, which okay. is weird. So that's why I didn't want to go down this road. And if I wanted, if I wanted to use it as a fifth car, I'll give you two answers. If I wanted the one that's going to get the most attention and it's going to be uh, the one that you know I'm not going to touch because I think the value is in the originality of it, I would do the Bronco. But if I wanted to get one that I'm going to use off road as a toy and then I want to make it my own, I would get the Wrangler. There you go. Okay. If I was going to build it up, I'd get the Wrangler. If I was going to keep it stock, I'd get the Ford. Wow, what a long response. Yeah, sorry, dude. I, I'm, I'm gonna a bad person it, to ask. I'm going to keep it much more simple. Um, if you are looking for a, a fun off-road vehicle that you want to use every day, uh, maybe you have uh, you know, a, a partner or a spouse and maybe a kid, um, the Forerunner is, is my number one choice. I, that, I that's really what I said, do. I think. Yeah, in, but in a, I in a roundabout way. Yeah, but I would put the Forerunner well on the top of my list. Okay. Just as a general purpose off-roader um, that, that that's going to last, it's going to be reliable, that you're going to be able to sell. 
I still think the Toyota is number one. Yeah, and see, the problem for me with that is I've got, we've got an FJ parked right there as well, and and that's basically just a cooler looking forerunner. Yeah, but not as practical. Yeah. And the tech is even worse than the FJ Cruiser. Yeah, I'm but it's like basically that. the same chassis. So th- I think the forerunner for just a general vehicle is the one I would get. If you're like me and you are single and just have a dog and just want to go have fun with the top down, I would probably get the Wrangler because you can get Wranglers um, and they're proven. The chassis has been around for three years and I do not want to deal with the headache that is trying to get a Bronco and then the headache that is potentially first year production problems like we're starting to see with the airbag in the top. I, I just I don't think that the Bronco is better enough than a Wrangler to warrant all the headaches that that comes with because the Jeep is very good off-road. Um, for me, it's good enough on-road to be livable. The, the Ford is amazing. They did a great job, but uh, I would put Forerunner number one for most folks in the general category. And then if you just want an off-road thing to have fun with the top down, get yourself a Wrangler. Yeah, uh, I would say, you know, the pragmatic part of me would say whichever one you can get. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, whichever one you can get and hopefully not pay a bump sticker for. Uh, because we're at that part of the uh, year right now where every time I drive by a dealership, uh, you know, we just bought a car for my mom, your grandma, and the only reason we were able to buy a car, by the way, it was a venue, was because basically they were unloading it off the truck and we were able to get the vehicle as it was being unloaded because it was going to be sold the next day. So, you know, whichever one you can actually buy if you've got the budget and they don't do any, you know, dealer trickery where you have to pay over budget or some other silliness. Um, yeah, get your, they're, they're all great. I mean, it's, it's just a, Right, they're it's, all it's, good it's, options. It's, you know, yeah. it's, it's a... It's a we're blessed with all these riches right now, uh, and hopefully if, if competition comes back, we'll actually have affordable choices. Now, for me, the, so if I, if I said general, get the foreigner, I, I'm also in a unique position, right? Like I had a small budget, I don't need four doors, and I wanted a convertible, and I wanted a manual transmission that was as small and lightweight as possible. So like the, the Jeep was the obvious choice there, but that's kind of a, once again, just like you, that's a weird set of buying criteria that, that a lot of people aren't going to fall into. Well, guys, thank you for joining us. I hope uh, that we didn't confuse you more than we helped you. Uh, I hope that uh, this was enlightening to some respect. Uh, And like I said, you know, we're living through some weird times, but we're also living through some good times. You know, all three of these will uh, take you well beyond where you probably are um, comfortable going. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So get out there, have some fun in the dirt, and let us know what you chose in the comment section below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on one of the podcast streaming platforms. Be sure to leave us a review and a like. Yeah, and then uh, if you want all TFL content in one place, go to tfl-studios.com where we put everything in one place so you can keep track of the podcast, the videos, and even the news stories. Ciao.